So I'm Pam Dawling, and uh, I'm the author of this book, Sustainable Market Farming. And uh, I made you these handouts. <laughs> um, so you might want to flip through if you haven't already. Things are kind of in the same order as um, we'll get to them in the slideshow, but I wanted to save you time writing down things that are already printed for you. Um, I also brought bookmarks if you want one of those, and uh, Growing for Market magazine if you don't if you don't know this. I've got some copies here you can take one with you when you go. Uh, I write for this not every time, but it comes out ten times a year. Um, I have a website sustainablemarketfarming.com and I do a blog post there once a week, usually Monday or Tuesday and you can get it sent to your email if you like it or through Facebook. There's my email address and it's on the handout. Um, don't tell everybody but if you wanted to email me with a question or a suggestion or something, feel free. Um, I will be putting this slideshow up on Slideshare uh, after, afterwards. Uh, Slideshare.net, you can go to slideshare.net and there's a search box at the top and you put my name in, Pam Dawling, and then it opens up a choice menu thing of different slides shows I've done and you can, if you want to see this one again because there's a lot of detailed material in it, you can uh, see that one or if you want to see a different one, you can see a different one. Um, do ask questions as we go along. Um, otherwise, onward with the cover crops. So I'm going to be covering benefits of cover crops, five steps for planting cover crops, uh, a bit about how we use cover crops at Twin Oaks, the winter cover crops we use, the spring and summer ones we use, um, so a little bit about using cover crops for pest control, a bit about cover crop mixes, and some about using small scale equipment if you're just doing small areas, so you don't have to have a great big tractor, uh, a little bit talking about a permanent rotation for vegetable crops and how to fit a particularly winter cover crops in to your vegetable production so that you're not losing out on the food because you're being worried. <laughs> I have to tell you about Austrian winter peas. Um, and then, <laughs> assuming we still have time, at the end um, I have what I'm calling stand in one of our fields for 10 years and it's really looking at our rotation and what, which crops are going to be planted there, which food crop, which winter cover crop, which next food crop, next cover crop, and so on, sequence. There's a big resources section, but it's all on your handout, so you can take it away with you. Um, lots of benefits of using cover crop. Who uses cover crops already? Most, okay. So you're probably familiar with some of these. Um, adding organic matter and nutrients to the soil. Smothering weeds, that's an important one. Um, also, cover crops increase the biological activity in the soil. You're sort of feeding all those microorganisms and then they're making more microorganisms and so it goes. Uh, reducing erosion, the roots of the cover crops hold onto the soil for you. Um, using, doing cover crops will improve the tilt of your soil and also the subsoil structure, even though you can't see it down there where the little roots go. Improving soil drainage, which follows on from improving the subsoil structure. Um, also, uh, improving at the same time the soil's ability to uh, absorb rain and store it. So it's not just about um, not getting the soil washed away, it's also uh, making your soils more resilient in the face of unusual weather. Um, some cover crops will salvage excess nutrients from the soil and make them then available to the next crop that you plant. Uh, some add nitrogen, some attract beneficial insects, some reduce pests, and they all, to some extent, help sequester carbon while, while they're growing. Of course, it comes back, but it's, for a while, it's good. Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities for cover crops. I'm going to tell you some good resources, and I'm going to tell you about the ones that work best for us, So you, because we're nearby, um, we're halfway to Richmond from here. Um, you can uh, try the ones that work well for us and they'll be more guaranteed to be successful in our climate. Um, but there is no one solution for everything and so it's good to try different types and write down your results uh, so that you can uh, know what to do differently next year. Uh, it's good to be flexible about your plans because the weather is unpredictable and not in, under our control. 
Um, so you might need to make a change in your plans. So I will talk about that some and having backup plans. So to plan cover crops, I've got five steps. First of all, identify your opportunities to grow cover crops, the, time, the times in between, your food crops probably. Um, but then clarify what your cover crop goals are, what are your main reasons for growing a cover crop at that time. And then make a short list of which cover crops are suitable for that situation. And then choose among your options, record your decision, record the results, or do what you said you were going to do, record the results, and then review it and see what you would want to do different next year. So we're going to look at each one of those steps in a bit more detail. Um, there are cover crop opportunities all year round. Most people think about the winter cover crops, but you can in fact do cover crops. Um, you can start in late winter or early spring. If you have some land where you haven't already got a cover crop and you know you're not going to plant the food crop for six weeks or more, you can till in those weeds and sow oats. And that will deal with the weeds and will produce more organic matter for the soil. Um, during the spring, the summer and the fall, if you've got a gap between food crops of four weeks or more, you can sow a short-term summer cover crop. And sometimes you can get a jump on getting your winter cover crops in by under-sowing um, a food crop at last cultivation. So you, you cultivate, that's what you can see in this photo here, you can see sweet corn and underneath it is growing soybeans and oats. This is what we do with our last planting of sweet corn. We till between the rows when it's two weeks after planting and we hoe in the row and then we till again. Um, come in, sit down, uh, have a handout. <laughs> um, we're just talking about cover crop planting and this is the first step. Um, looking for where the opportunities are. Um, about four weeks after sowing the corn, you go in and you sow oats and soybeans and then those will grow and um, at the end of the season, when the corn is finished, you don't have to till the soil and plant another cover crop. You've already got it in place for the winter. Um, the usual, the most common uh, place that people do think of sowing cover crops is in the fall when your food crops are finished. Put something in there to grow during the winter. Uh, in late winter, you can do frost seeding of small seeded things like clovers. Um, you might, you don't want to get out and till, but um, if you've got some prepared land, uh, you can go out in the early morning and sow clover when the ground's frozen, and then it, as it thaws, um, it goes down into the soil and will grow. You don't have to worry about watering, you don't have to worry about covering the seeds. Um, that's a nice little trick. Um, should you ever have a crop failure, um, you can uh, get rid of it and get disc it in, till it in, and sow a cover crop and feel a lot better immediately. Uh, <laughs> it's happened to me. Um, also, you can, if you've got spare space, grow a year-round cover crop, a green fallow crop. And I I'll, I'll, will tell more about each of these as we get to them. So, from talking about those general opportunities, you want to think about a particular opportunity that you have and um, talk about it in a bit more detail. You know, when is it when's the space first available for the cover crop, and when do you need it, the cover crop to be finished by. It's a sort of window of the opportunity. And what are the ambient temperatures during that time? Is it going to be frosty or, or no frost? Um, will you have any shortfall of rain or irrigation? Of course, you can't entirely predict the rain, but you know if you know that you've got plenty of irrigation water, if it doesn't rain, then you can make some choices, whereas if you couldn't possibly irrigate over where you're the space you're talking about, you need to make other choices. Uh, think about what's the preceding food crop. You don't want to plant a cover crop that's in the same family. And what's the following food crop? Likewise, you don't want to, because of planning a crop rotation and wanting to avoid pests and diseases, you don't want to be growing mustards after broccoli or before kale, or especially not in between the two. Um, the second step is to clarify what your main goals are for that particular situation. So think about um, which of those cover crop benefits that we talked about, which ones are your main priorities for that site. Uh, is it to smother weeds? There are some cover crops that are particularly good at that. Sorghum sudan grass, cereal rye, 
buckwheat brassicas. Um, it's in about organic matter and nutrients. Some cover crops are better than others at uh, growing big and providing lots of organic matter. Is it about increasing the biological activity in the soil or reducing erosion um, or improving the soil structure um, or the soil drainage? Um, if you want to improve the soil drainage, some crops that are particularly good are sorghum sedan grass, sunflowers, uh, daikon, sweet clover, alfalfa, brassicas, sugar beets and forage beets. Um, or is it about improving the soil's ability to absorb and hold water? So think about which of those are your main goals for that particular site, and then also the secondary goals. Um, you might want to salvage leftover nutrients. If you planted a food crop and then it didn't um, work out so well, you put all those nutrients into the soil and some of them are still there, or maybe you just were very generous with your compost, spreading and there's lots of nutrients still in the soil, you can grow some cover crops to salvage some of those nutrients to absorb them and grow and then when that cover crop is put back in the soil you get those nutrients back again. Uh, mostly that's going to be the grasses, the small grains, the brassicas, um, annual ryegrass which I actually wouldn't recommend to anybody. It can become a weed in our area. We had a terrible time with it. Oh, so you might read about how good it is, but those are written by northerners, and I wouldn't do it, I really wouldn't. Um, if you also want to fix some nitrogen, you want to plant some legumes in the, in the cover crop mix, or, or, or legumes on their own, clovers, vetches, peas and beans, lentils, sun hemp, a bit expensive. <laughs> um, if you want to attract beneficial insects, there are some flowering cover crops that are particularly good for that, like particularly buckwheat, everybody loves buckwheat. Um, if you want to do biofumigation for pest or weed control, some of the brassicas, sorghum sedan grass, sun hemp, sesame, some of those are good for particular dealing with particular problems. Uh, if you need to kill nematodes, um, there's Pacific gold mustard. I have a slide about mustards coming up later. Uh, white lupins, iron and clay cowpeas, open pollinated French marigolds, who would have guessed, and sesame. <laughs> Those will help uh, kill off nematodes if you're unfortunate enough to have those, as we have been. So once you've identified your main goals and your secondary goals for a particular site, then you want to make a short list of which cover crops you're thinking about. Uh, and they really divide up into six groups, and it's really two threes. It's the cool season and the warm season stuff. So if it's going to be frosty, you want the cool season stuff. If you're in a frost-free period, you can do the warm season ones. And for each group, there's grasses, legumes, and broadleaf plants. So that sort of narrows it down a bit. Um, this managing cover crops profitably, if you want to buy a book or get a book, I would say that's the best one to get. It's by Sayre, and uh, you can actually get it all free online uh, if you don't. Sometimes it's nice just to have a book, especially if you're kind of walking around the fields or sitting in bed. Reading. Um, that's the best book. Uh, I have a chapter in my book and also nine pages of charts. So I go into it in quite a bit of detail, but if you want a whole book, then I really recommend that one. And there are others that are mentioned in the handout as well that I thought were good. Um, so then, to help simplify which choices you might make between cover crops, uh, here's a list for looking at fall cover crops. You work back from your frost date, and you see how many days have you got um, before the frost. Uh, if you've got 80 to 120 days, you might well grow another vegetable before you think about cover crops. Uh, or you can do buckwheat, soy, cowpeas, Japanese millet, sorghum, sedan grass. Um, if you've only got 60 to 80 days, you can still do buckwheat, soy, cowpeas. You can also do Miami peas, and not frost hardy. Japanese millet, sorghum, sedan grass. Any of that group will die with a frost. Um, or you can do, if you want it to grow into the winter, you can do oats with Austrian winter peas or crimson clover or red clover. The oats in our kind of climates will die in the winter, but the um, legumes will carry on. Uh, if you're 40 to 60 days before the frost and you want a winter killed cover crop, you can do oats with soybeans or Miami peas. And if you want a cover crop to survive the winter, you can do either winter barley or winter wheat, 
with Austrian winter peas or crimson clover or hairy vetch or red clover or fava beans. You still have a lot of choices at that point. If it's 20 to 40 days before the frost, choices are getting fewer. You can still do winter rye, winter wheat or winter barley. And you can still do a crimson clover, Austrian winter peas, red clover. Or if you've got 40 days, you can do hairy vetch. But at that point, it's too late to usefully sow any um, cover crops that will be killed by the frost because they'll only grow a weeny little bit and then they'll die and you'll get winter weeds coming up. So uh, don't do that. <laughs> um, so when is the frost date around here or is it all different depending on where you are? Okay, um, mine is about October the 14th. Mm -hmm. um, yes. It's almost, something like almost that. exactly so something like that. Right. Yeah. 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 Where, where are you? Earliesville. Oh, me too. Okay, October the 14th. Then. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's what you're looking at. Coming up. Uh, yeah, another couple of weeks. Uh, up to 10 days past the frost date, you can still do winter rye or winter wheat with Austrian winter peas. And after that, uh, up to a month past your first frost date, you can still do winter rye. But it's too late for anything else, really. Mm. And I wouldn't do winter right after that. Were you going to ask a question? No, I was just thinking about it. I was, um, had heard that winter wheat had to be done a little bit early, a lot earlier than winter rye, but... Well, considering you can do winter late, rye up to a month yeah, after. Yeah. 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 I didn't realize yeah. it could go that late, actually. Right, that's where, it, yes, winter wheat is not as hardy. That's good. Uh, if you're in the summer still, and you want to narrow down your choices of cover crops, by looking at how long you've got. If you've only got four weeks, 28 days, um, you can grow mustards or buckwheat, um, or weeds, if you're careful not to let them set seed. You know, it might just let them grow up and then as soon as they look like they're gonna flower, till them under. Uh, if you've got at least 45 days, you can do soy or Japanese millet, along with uh, buckwheat or mustards. Th those are still options. <laughs> If you have 50 to 60 days, you can do brown top millet or sun hemp. Um, maybe a bit warmer climates than here, though, I think. I don't actually have any. Does anyone have any experience with sun hemp? We should forget about that. Um, if you've got 60 or 70 days, you can do German foxtail millet, pearl millet, and some of the faster cowpeas. Um, and if it seems like it's a high moisture year, you can. Uh, choose the most weed suppressing crops like alfalfa, but if it looks like water's going to be in short supply, you probably don't want to do alfalfa because it won't do well without enough water. Um, the fifth step is recording your decisions, um, putting them into practice, I didn't say that, um, but also record your results so that you know what you might need to change next year. Like if you sow something, October the 10th, it doesn't work very well, write that down so that next year you stop trying to sow that one a bit sooner. <laughs> okay, so here's our favorite cover crops at Twin Oaks. Um, as far as the winter cover crops go, in the grasses, we like oats, winter wheat, and winter rye. Um, I know some growers do sort of exotic uh, grains, but we stick with those ones. We don't do barley. Um, it's not as hardy, I think, and that's why we don't. And in the legumes, we like hairy vetch, crimson clover, and Austrian winter peas. These are our sort of go-to winter cover crops that work well for us. Uh, and in the summer, for the grasses, we, we really like sorghum sedan grass if we've got a big enough space and a big enough time. It grows really huge. Uh, Japanese millet is a bit smaller. We like that one. Uh, legumes, we use soybeans, and uh, broadleaf crops, we use buckwheat. So if you're feeling at a loss amongst the 57 varieties of wonderful cover crops, mm -hmm. these ones work really well for us in Central Virginia, and you might try those, they're in the handout. Um, so next I'm going to talk about winter cover crops at Twin Oaks. Um, we sort of divided these up into different types. We do some winter killed cover crops, we do some under sowing as I mentioned, we do some no-till, uh, we like to include legumes wherever we can, and then I'll talk about examples for sowing in September, October and November. Um, oats is our main um, winter killed cover crop. Um, it 
works very well to smother weeds and because it dies in the winter pretty reliably in our climate it's very easy in early spring to turn that dead mulch material in uh, and sow the early food crops. Yeah. So that's what I'm showing here is, uh, oh yeah, in order to have oats grow well, you need to sow them in August or the very first part of September in our climate area. So you have to have food crops that finish before you want to sow the oats. In our case, that's going to be the early sweet corn, the spring broccoli, cabbage, and any spring planted potatoes. Those are going to be the things that finish first and give us the best opportunity to get oats in in good time in August. And then next spring, or next February, if you call it spring, you can disc in whatever's left of the oats and you can get the soil ready. It's, some of it's the same list, cabbage and broccoli, March potatoes, first sweet corn, but also other very early crops like spinach, peas, carrots, beets, that you might do early on. Um, this, you like this uh, sequence. Um, ideally, you would sow the oats five to eight weeks before the average first frost, so you get big enough plants to give a, a good amount of organic matter before they get winter killed. So, um, for us, we do we do from August the fifth to September the seventeenth, which is actually I mean four weeks before the frost, um, but it still works. If you sow too early, the oats can head up and then drop seed, and you don't want to have that happen to you. And if you sow too late, they just stay very small and um, don't do a very good job of holding the soil together. Uh, it's worth remembering that as you go into the fall, uh, a delay in a sowing date can make a big difference in, in the rate of growth of the crop. Because everything is slowing down, the days get shorter, the temperatures get lower, uh, and everything takes longer to reach maturity. Uh, so you don't want to delay too much. Um, oats are low cost, easy to establish, fast growing. Uh, there is a minimum germination temperature of 38 Fahrenheit. They will grow to two up to four feet if they're not killed before then. So that's the ideal, is to get them up to that four feet high before, or before they get killed. Um, they're tolerant of a wide range of pH and even some poor soils and some tolerance to flooding. They add lots of biomass, they're very good at shading up germinating weeds and at salvaging nutrients. Um, if you buy cheap feed store horse oats, watch out for GMO canola. We used to buy feed store oats and use them for cover crops. And then I noticed amongst the cover crop these yellow flowers and I realized it was canola, and we don't grow canola. And nearly all of the canola that's grown in the United States, if it's not, uh, it's, is um, GMO. I don't mm. know. Does anyone grow organic canola? I don't know. Maybe they do. But in general, the canola that you see and, and around is going to be GMO. So there, I assume I had GMO plants, and I didn't want to um, harbor those. So I pulled those out, and I didn't buy feed store oats anymore. So now we buy organic spring oats. They're called spring oats, but you can actually sow them in late summer or, or spring or uh, late summer, early spring, or early fall or early spring, yeah. Um, we're in zone 7A. We used to be in 6B, but we've got, we've got warmer. Um, if we sow oats in August or early September as we plan to, they reliably get winter killed. If you only have little seedlings, they'll die at 17 Fahrenheit. But if you've got bigger plants, they'll get some cold damage, the top half of the plant or so, around about that kind of temperature, anything below 20. But they won't get fully killed off till it gets down to 6 or 7 Fahrenheit. Um, if they die, they're very easy to till in. And if they don't die, maybe you live towards Richmond or something, um, they're still easier to till in than rye. And you can get planting sooner. They have a little allelopathic effect. Rye is notorious or famous for this, depending how you look at it. Uh, the roots exude um, chemicals which inhibit seed germination. Mm. Usually when we're doing oats, we're going to be planting um, you know, 
potato pieces or broccoli plants, um, so it isn't it isn't really an issue. And I as, I also think that once the oats have been winter killed and they've just been lying there on the soil for a while, I don't think there's going to be any allelopathic effect left. Um, but if your oats didn't die and you tilled them in and you wanted to sow small seeds, you might plan ahead and, and incorporate the cover crop a couple of weeks earlier than you would otherwise have done, just in case, because you don't want to inhibit your germination of your seeds. Uh, of course, when it comes to inhibiting the germination of the weed seeds, it's great. <laughs> um, there are some limitations on using oats. Um, they're not as good at breaking up compacted subsoil. So if you're working with some very compacted soil and you're wondering which cover crop to choose, this one wouldn't be the best. Um, they don't have much tolerance to heat or drought, a um, bit more than rye, but they don't, not much. And they don't add nitrogen, of course, they're not a legume, and they don't attract beneficial insects. But you can mix cover crops, and so you can get the benefits of these that you want for these other, um, like if you want beneficial insects to come to your cover crop, you can add in something flowering. Uh, there are other cover crops that winter kill. Um, they usually, there's the frost tender group, uh, sorghum, sudan grass, uh, buckwheat, soy, cowpeas, Miami peas, uh, millets, and we're not mentioning sun hemp anymore. And there's also a group which winter kill around about between 5 and 20 Fahrenheit. Um, barley is in there along with oats, bursine clover, lana vetch, purple vetch, fava beans, field peas, oil, and fodder radish. So those all will get winter killed. Some people have had great results using that um, kind of daikon, the driller radish. It makes great big roots, opens up the soil a lot, and then it dies, the leaves just sort of pancake out on the soil, and then they disappear entirely, and hardly anything else grows, and so it's very easy to plant that come the early spring. Um, yeah, so you might, you might try that. I know um, in VABF I remember hearing about some people doing that. We avoid brassica cover crops because of collagen bugs. Um, okay, so under sowing. Uh, some people call this interseeding. Basically, uh, you're uh, sowing the cover crop between rows of an already growing food crop. Um, I already told you, yeah. So you cultivate two weeks after you sow or plant your food crop, and then after another two weeks, and then sow the cover crop. It's the usual time scale. Uh, you do need to bear in mind that you might need to irrigate, uh, like with overhead sprinklers or something, even though your food crop has got nice big roots and doesn't need a lot of irrigation. When you sow that cover crop seed, you will need to do overhead irrigation to get it established. Um, the benefit, one of the benefits of doing this is that you can get uh, oats or, and soy, as we've got here, you can get the oats and soy sown at the right time to grow big and then the food crop finishes and you've already got that cover crop in place. You don't have to invert the soil again and uh, the cover crop will grow into the winter. Because you can't always wait, like if we waited till our sweet corn was finished, uh, it would be too late to sow oats. Uh, but this way works very nicely. Um, oh well, I've already told you quite a bit about this. So our sixth sweet corn, we sow it in the middle of July and we under sow it four weeks after seeding. So that's the middle of August, so it's the perfect time for sowing oats and soy. Um, um, it it's works as well because oats and soy are somewhat shade tolerant, you know, they've got big corn plants growing. And they also tolerate foot traffic when you want to go in there and harvest your sweet corn. And that's important. <laughs> it's no good having a really delicate uh, cover crop planted with a food crop if you have to tiptoe in there to harvest. Uh, it is important not to be tilling between very big food crop plants. Uh, they say with corn, you shouldn't really be tilling in between the rows if it's more than knee high. Although I confess I have pretended to be seven feet tall, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> but it's better not to, so plan ahead not to. Um, oh, and the next crop the next year is going to be potatoes in March, so it helps us uh, get the soil ready. Um, the keys to success with under sowing are the timing is very critical, the timing of planting a food crop, the timing of cultivation, the timing of sowing your cover crop. Um, you, it's 
question of balancing the vigor of the two kinds of crop. Uh, ideally, you want a fairly vigorous food crop and a not too vigorous cover crop to make it work. Um, and you don't want to have the leaf canopy of the food crop already closed or the vines already run if it's a vining crop. That's too late. Your cover crop seed then wouldn't get enough light. Um, you do have to make sure you've got a nice clean seed bed to start with. Yeah. Uh, do, so do you ever do any undersowing of tomatoes that are trellised or? Um, no, mostly we do no-till for those, okay. which I, I will show you. You could. I mean, I have done, uh, oh, you mean like after you plant the mm -hmm. tomatoes? Um, we've done it with peas. We've had rows of trellised peas and we've sown oats in the spring underneath and mowed the oats. That works quite well. Uh, you do use a high enough seeding rate, it's not time to skimp on the seeds. Um, there's some things that work in New York State that don't work in Virginia. I read about these and I didn't sort of think about geography. Don't make this mistake that I did. Um, so things that work in New York State that don't work down here, uh, that sound wonderful when you first read them. They do kale, under sown with rye and hairy vetch, uh, or oats in the middle of August, but um, we don't want to sow rye in August in Virginia because it will head up and then you've got heading, huge heading rye plants. It doesn't work. Also, we want our kale to overwinter and we want to harvest it during the winter and in the spring. We don't want it to be shadowed out by cover crops. So don't try that example. <laughs> don't try this winter squash and pumpkins under sown with red or crimson clover. We tried this. Um, what they do up there is they wait till the vines are just about to run, and they even if they've started to run, they flop the vines over, sow the cover crop, flop the vines back. We tried it, but here the vines just grow so much quicker that um, it, it, it just doesn't work. The clover seed was wasted. We also tried under sowing clover seed in sweet corn, and that didn't work for us. It was just too hot and dry. We couldn't get the clover germinated enough. Uh, and, um, and we found we prefer to use soybeans. <laughs> so that's what we do now. Uh, you could look for areas to grow long-term cover crops, like an all-year green fallow, uh, or um, corners and edges where you can't um, really plant food crops. You could plant perennial flowering crops to attract beneficials. Or you could, if you've got a big area that you have in clovers, for instance, you could mow part of it, leave part of it for your beneficial insects, or till out part of it and plant. Uh, those are some other options. Uh, what we do is we have a whole big clover patch um, all year. Um, how this happened was that we had a bit more of a kind of ad hoc rotation plan, and we had our garden divided up into 10 main plots, and we we seemed to use them all every year, but we sat down one winter to figure out a, a, a better crop rotation. And in the process, we discovered a sort of spare crop. The crops we wanted to grow and their cover crops fit into nine plots. And we had a spare one, so we thought, well, we can use this to replenish the soil. So what, how we make it work is that we under sow the clover mix um, after we've transplanted our fall brassicas. So we plant the rows of brassicas and cabbage out and um, hoe until between the rows after two weeks after we've transplanted and again four weeks after transplanting. And then we go in and we broadcast the clover and then we water like crazy for a few days uh, until the clover germinates. It doesn't take long in August. We have a long thin patch and we put out two sprinklers from different hydrants and we water that night, first night and then we move them, we water the second night, we move them back for the third night, back for the fourth night. And by then they're well germinated and uh, we don't have to water like crazy any longer. We can do like once a week after that. Um, and that wor this works, has worked very well for us. The mix we use, uh, this recipe is in the handout, for each 100 square feet we use one ounce of crimson clover, one ounce of ladino white clover, and two ounces of medium red clover. Uh, we kind of uh, lucked out in finding this mix. We just 
one time we mixed the seeds we had and then we found out, oh, this works because uh, crimson clover grows really fast in the fall. It's in that annual. Um, once you get to the spring, uh, the other clovers take over as the crimson clover dies off. Um, there are three different types of white clover. You want the big one, Ladino. It grows 12 to 15 inches tall. If you can't find that, get the intermediate ones, the Dutch and the New Zealand. They grow up to 12 inches. But what you don't want is the dwarf, dwarf white, wild white. Um, that one is used for orchard alleys and stuff, but uh, it's too. It doesn't make enough biomass in the mix uh, to come to. Um, not get shadowed out by the other clovers. And then when you buy red clover seed, you want to get the medium one. It's sometimes called multi-cut, which means you can mow it several times and it will still be alive. You don't want to get the mammoth one, because once you mow that, it's not much of it's going to come back. Um, okay, I told you all those things already. So our, our hope is that when we do this, we'll be able to then keep the clover growing for the whole of the next year and just mow it every now and then. So in the early spring, we'll mow it, we'll get rid of those broccoli stumps and any weeds that are popping up. And then we mow it again when we see that the crimson clover is seeding, because we don't want that clover seed to stay in our soil. Crimson clover makes some hard seed, it's called. It sort of stays dormant for a while, and then it springs to life when you weren't expecting it and you didn't want it. So it's better not to let that seed. Um, so we have several points during the year when we'll look at it and assess how is the clover doing. You know, if, if it didn't germinate well enough to start with, or we've got too many weeds, then uh, we'll face the facts and uh, disc it in and sow a different cover crop, um, depending on the time of year. Uh, it's often been like, oh, this, this spring particularly, I looked at our clover patch in the early spring, there were a lot of bare spaces. I think the crimson clover has got frozen out, actually. Um, but I uh, haven't yet had to till it in. You know, I look at it and I think, oh, this is not going to make it this year. It doesn't look good enough. But just with that regular mowing, you get rid of the annual weeds and the clovers flourish and it can do really, really well. Um, we, our goal, our, our hope always, is that we can keep it for a year and a half, practically, and disc it in the next February. And clovers break down very quickly in the soil, so it's another one you can do before your early spring crops. Um, I'm going to say a bit about organic no-till. Um, we do one year in ten, we do some no-till. The goal here is to kill the cover crop without disking it in, so you're not inverting the soil layers you plant food crops into the dying residue. Uh, there's three ways to kill cover crops without herbicides. There's the, the winter killed cover crops, which we already talked about, mow killing, which is the easiest probably, and roll killing, which you kind of need some specialized equipment for. You need a crimping roller. You can make them if you're that way inclined, uh, or you can buy them. Uh, otherwise, stick with the mowing. <laughs> Um, there's a related approach called reduced tillage, where you just till out some strips in the middle of your cover crop and plant your food in there. Um, some, in some practices, you gradually till out more and more of the cover crop as the food crop gets bigger. In others, you can leave some strips uh, growing. Probably the real reduced tillage, you leave some strips growing. <laughs> Um, the benefits of no-till are that um, the soil is kept covered, so you don't get any erosion. Um, you reduce the soil compaction because you're not having tractor passes over and over to disc it in, spread compost, all the rest of it. You don't invert the soil layers at all, and so the habitat for the soil microorganisms is not disturbed, and so you get really high numbers of worms and microbes. Um, and also the root channels of the cover crops are left there and that will give you good drainage uh, and good aeration in the soil. Um, the organic matter increases, the soil structure improves. Um, and um, when you do mow or, or roll kill <laughs> the cover crop, uh, it lasts a lot longer than if you disked it in. So it doesn't burn up as quick. 
so you can get benefits from it for longer. Uh, the soil is more resilient in drought if you've just mowed rather than disking it. Uh, if, you, if you're going to have drought, <laughs> who knows? Um, you can get higher yields um, than with tilling. But of course, we don't ever know exactly what's going to happen. Um, the soil does stay cooler into the summer, and that can be an advantage or it can be a disadvantage depending what you're growing next. Um, there are other benefits. Those are all benefits for the soil. Uh, there are other benefits like uh, you're not using plastic mulch. Um, if you're having a wet spring, you can get out with a mower um, before you can get out and, and turn the soil under you know, because it's, uh, you're not cutting into the soil. So if, you've, if you're having a really wet spring, uh, you could consider this if you've got the right kind of cover crop and the right kind of food crop. Um, fewer tractor passes in total, that saves a lot. Uh, you're not bringing up any new weed seeds. Uh, you might be able to suppress some pathogens and pests by not turning the soil. Um, the mulch grows in situ, it's right there. You don't have to haul it and spread it. It's just, it's nice. <laughs> uh, you can get cleaner pumpkins or similar sorts of things that sit on the soil, squash, you know, cucumbers. Um, the legumes in the mix can provide all the nitrogen that the next food crop needs, which uh, saves you money because the cost of nitrogen from vetch seed is about half the cost of buying organic fertilizers. Um, and you don't once you sow the seed, you don't have to, you know, you've already spread the fertilizer sort of thing. Um, the legumes make a slow release fertilizer, which is very good for a, a long season crop. 15% uh, of the nitrogen is down in the roots, so it's right in place when you go to transplant. You pop in your transplants, 15% of the nitrogen from the cover crop is right there. 50% uh, of the total becomes available during that growing season, and 50% remains until the next growing season. A bit depends on your rainfall, but this is it, for example. Uh, and it may be that hairy vetch is going to increase your disease resistance of your plants and increase the longevity of the. They've done some research, and mm. tomato plants apparently can have an extra two or three weeks of healthy life uh, if you grew vetch for a no-till cover crop. Have you ever tried that? Or? We do it. We oh, do it. Oh, but yeah. I'm not done it scientifically. Ah, you have no control. Here we've got, <laughs> here we've done. Oh, yeah. look, those are dead already. Yeah. Oh, yeah. another two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't done that. Uh, it, it, does, uh, it does work very well for the tomatoes, which is what? We do it for our paste tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, because the soil stays colder, you don't want to do no-till for um, a warm weather crop that you want to have early like watermelons, who, nobody needs late watermelons, you know, everybody <laughs> wants them early. So you probably wouldn't want to choose this for this method for watermelons. Um, we do it for our paste tomatoes because there's a lot of them. We want them to crank out tomatoes for over a long season. We're not trying to get an early market or anything with them. We have some other tomato plants with cherries and slices and stuff um, for early. Um, pumpkins, cucumbers, squash, yeah, any of those you can do. Um, you can't really do direct seeded crops into no-till cover crops unless you've got special equipment. I've tried it, it didn't work. Um, there are some other places that are trying out various other no-till things. Um, if you want to do no-till for early spring vegetables, I already told you about the driller radishes. Um, you do frost tender cover crops, and then you put early spring no-till food crops in, like broccoli or cabbage transplants. Um, um, but you do have to be careful. If you're doing fast maturing spring crops, like I think of spinach, like you want your spinach to get growing really fast and crank out lots of spinach leaves. And it isn't going to work so well with no-till because it's not putting out the nitrogen fast enough. It's just putting the nitrogen out slowly. Works well for long season crops, doesn't work well for fast crops in the spring. Um, if you want to do late spring vegetables, that's kind of what we do. Um, you grow the no-till cover crops to flowering and then mow them or roll them. If you have one of those rollers, um, 
Austrian winter peas aren't a good no-till cover crop without sturdier companions. They just, there isn't much um, substance there when they die. They just become slime. There was a 1994 USDA trial. Um, they found that hairy vetch out-yielded plastic and fertilizer plots by 25% and out-yielded fertilized bare soil by 100%. So that's with the fertilizer. So uh, it, it really can work very well. Yeah. If you want to do fall vegetables into no-till cover crops, um, like perhaps broccoli, or if you're in a hot climate, which we're not, winter vegetables, um, you can do soybeans, cowpeas, foxtail millet. You can grow that mixture um, uh, and uh, mow kill it and then plant. Um, you could, I, I don't know, I read that you could do frost killed sorghum sedan grass. I'm trying to picture this. It seems a bit difficult to do. I think that they're, they've got their, um, they've got their, they've planted out their food crop and then they're sowing this, it, no it's no till. They've sowed this first and they're mowing it, they plant out the food crops. It sounds chancy to me because sorghum sedan grass is so huge. Has anybody tried something like that? Mm -mm. No. I have a question related to the last slide. The last bit, the millets, yes. Or the, the last, the previous slide. I'll wait till you finish this one. Go ahead. Well, I was just wondering with the vetch on the other side, oh. how is how do you kill that? How do we kill the vetch? We mow it. I'll show mm. you. Okay. Oh, well, I won't. I'll okay. tell you. <laughs> 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 um, some cautions about no-till. Uh, cold hardy cover crops need time in the spring to grow big enough to be useful. So you can't plan to do an overwintered cover crop and then mow it in March or early April because it's still not going to be very big at that stage. So it's not going to give you much mulch. You need to have a big cover crop to provide mulch. Uh, don't do watermelons. Uh, transplanting into untilled soil is harder than planting into loose tilled soil. I've got some crew members that don't want to do the no-till for the paste tomatoes because really you need to go out with like a, a, a narrow shovel and dig little holes if you're in the no-till, whereas if it's all nice and loose, it's easy to pop those transplants in. Um, but there are so many benefits to doing the no-till that I like to do. Um, hand seeding, I mentioned that. Uh, there were hopes of uh, no-till, it was sort of very, it was, all, it was all the rage at one point. There were hopes that you could like arrange your garden so you never had to till again organically. Um, there are some herbicide farmers that are doing permanent no-till, spraying everything to death with herbicides. I'm not recommending that. Um, if you've got a very small garden, you're doing your backyard garden, you can do it uh, if you've got a lot of time to pull weeds and you can bring in a lot of mulch to keep the surface covered um, in between no-till cover crops. But otherwise, for most of us, this is going to be something that you can do, like for us, one year in ten. Maybe you could manage to arrange it for more than that, uh, depending what food crops you're growing. So, here we go. Here's the basic steps of mow killing. So, in the fall, you sow the cover crop mix. Uh, use an inoculant if it's a new legume for you. You want to grow a good solid stand of a high biomass cover crop. Uh, make sure your seeds, cover crop seeds, have got a good germination rate. Make sure you sow generously enough uh, and get them up and doing well. Uh, you wait till the legume is about 50% flowering. Uh, that's going to be early May for us with the vetch. Uh, it's going to be late May up in Pennsylvania, just in case you come from there. Um, and then you go out and you mow to stop it growing. You don't want to start doing this uh, before it's 50% flowering, especially if you're rolling. If you're rolling, it's less likely to kill off the vetch. <laughs> then you have trouble. <laughs> the rye should be, if you're doing a rye and vetch mix, which is the traditional one, it should be at the soft dough stage. So take some kernels and bite them. They shouldn't be hard yet. If they are, you have to hurry up. Um, but they shouldn't be watery. They should have some doughiness to the, to the, to the rye, to the grain. <laughs> So then you mow it and you plant the food crop into the dying mulch. Uh, you try not to disturb the mulch much at all. Um, if you've got special equipment, you can seed, but we have not. What we do, we do one year in 10, as I said. Um, 
We're going to transplant our Roma paste tomatoes in early May. We don't want, need early ripening, so it's a good choice for a food crop. Um, we finish our spring broccoli and cabbage in early July. And we usually try and do a round of buckwheat summer cover crop because we don't, um, we want to have the ground available to get this cover crop in in the second week of September. That's the best time we've found to, to sow it, to get a really good big amount of it. So we do, we do buckwheat in between. That deals with some annual weeds and uh, attracts some beneficial insects and keeps us all happy. So September the 7th to the 14th are our ideal planting dates. We do, now we do winter rye, hairy vetch, and we do Austrian winter peas as well in the same mix. Um, we added in the Austrian winter peas because we read that they reduce the incidence of septorial leaf spot if you're growing tomatoes afterwards, which we are. Uh, your goal is to get four inch tall vetch before it gets too cold, before it gets to 22 Fahrenheit <laughs> and everything slows down. And then um, we mow it really close to the ground when the vetch is flowering for us. That's May the 1st to May the 5th or something like that. Uh, we use our hay mower. It cuts really close to the ground and the plants just drop down and all chopped up into little bits. You don't want a mower that's going to chop your no-till cover crop up into little bits because it will disintegrate quicker if you do so. Something that leaves long stalks. You can do it with a scythe if you're doing a backyard scale. Um, and then we plant, plant the paste tomatoes into it. Um, because our climate's hot, hot and humid, and I expect yours is too, um, the no-till mulch will disintegrate in kind of about eight weeks. So it's good for the first eight weeks of these tomato plants. And then we roll big bales of spoiled hay between the rows. So we plant our rows five and a half feet apart. This is this is key. <laughs> uh, and we do the stake and weave system, Florida string weaving, and then we can just squeeze a roll of um, a bale of hay in between the rows. And that will see us through to the end of the tomato season. Uh, but without that, the cover crop does all rot away and we get weeds. So it's, it's necessary in our climate. If you're in a dry climate, um, dry air or dry, <laughs> Uh, you know, either less humidity or less rain or both, um, your cover crop will last longer spread on the ground and you might not need to do this. But the reality for us is that we'll need the second mulch later. Um, the timing is critical as a lot of these things. Uh, the wrong weather can jinx your plans. If you don't get a good stand of cover crop, um, you'll get weeds. Um, so you will need a plan B, which will probably involve tilling in what you hoped was going to be a no-till cover crop. I've had to do this. Uh, add some compost because you're not going to get the nitrogen from the cover crop. Uh, and then find another mulch or get some spoiled hay or straw sooner. You could get some regrowth of the cover crop um, after you've mowed it, if, if it's something that can go wrong. Not so much uh, if you've uh, mowed really close the surface, but if your mowing has been uneven or a bit too high, uh, some of the cover crop will try to grow again. So what you can do is take a big brush mower between the rows. Obviously, if you're five and a half feet, you probably don't have a tractor that small. But uh, we have a BCS brush mower, and we, we do it. And it doesn't, once is enough, it doesn't try to regrow again. You could get more fungal diseases and slugs, though I haven't noticed any problem with that. Oh yeah, for people in arid zones, you have to water the mulch <laughs> um, in order to get the nitrogen out of it. We don't have to worry about that. Um, suitable cover crops for no-till. Um, you need to decide, you know, are you looking for a winter-killed no-till system or a winter-hardy uh, no-till system? It definitely helps to have a mix of a grass and a legume, or, or more than one grass, or more than one legume. Um, the grasses, the cereals, provide a sort of scaffolding for the um, legumes to climb up, and you'll get much better growth that way. Um, usually you want a two grass to one legume ratio. You can use more legumes if you want, um, but you need at least that much. Um, it, it can be an advantage to do 
a mixture of legumes uh, in case the weather is not what you thought it was going to be. One might struggle and the other does better. Some people say it's always best to do a mix. Um, equipment, tractor equipment for doing no-till. Uh, we use our hay mower conditioner, as I said, not the bush hog. Um, roll killing, we talked about that. Um, oh, Ron Morse, who used to be at Virginia Tech, he designed this no-till planting aid, which uh, is a piece of tractor equipment that, that really, it's like it tills up a three inch or two inch strip of soil. It just works it up at a very narrow bit of soil. It looked like a really good idea, um, but we, at that point, we were not looking for something to, you know, if you want to sow seeds, direct seed into a no-till, uh, that could be a way to go. There are transplanters designed for use with thick organic mulches. There are no-till seeders as well that you can get for your tractor if you're looking at specialized equipment because you're going to do a lot of no-till. Uh, adding in legumes, we try to add them whenever possible. Um, I already said to get the most nitrogen from legumes, you want to grow them until they're starting to flower. So you want to time everything so that um, they're just starting to flower when it's time for you to prepare that soil for the next food crop. Uh, often for our later crops, we'll rely, if the legume has, been, has grown well, we'll rely on that for the nitrogen, and we won't add any extra compost. Or we might just add a little bit for the other miraculous things in compost that are not just nitrogen. <laughs> um, Crimson clover is our favorite for overwintering. We use it whenever we can. You could use red clover if you can't find crimson clover. It doesn't grow as so, so big. Uh, for warm weather, cowpeas or soybeans. Um, uh, Austrian winter peas are a good legume. They're the sort of the last one you can plant in the year, the most cold tolerant. But I will tell you more about them. We have a slide if you wanted to let your flowering go a little longer just to, for pollinators and things, do you have any sense of how much value you lose? Um, it's, no, I don't. But it is um, also like you might not want the seeds. Right. So, but you could leave like you could leave strips around the edges or something, or strip every ten feet or something. You can try that. Okay. Yeah. Um, hairy vetch. Uh, it's very widely adapted, and it's cold hardy down to minus fifteen, so it's unlikely to die where we are. Uh, it grows quickly in the fall. Uh, it will get in the spring, once you get to spring. If you're growing it on its own, it'll get to about two feet high. But if you've got some grain plants, so scaffolding, it can get up to six feet tall. So you can get lots of biomass. Uh, it needs to germinate in 60 degree Fahrenheit soil, so you want to do it before it cools down too much in the fall. Uh, so at least 40 to 60 days before you estimate you'll get a 28 Fahrenheit frost. Um, so for us then, between September the 7th and uh, October the 10th, um, we usually really try for that second week of September because that's when, if we sow it then, we know we'll get big um, biomass, big bulk load of stuff. <coughs> Uh, it's best killed at early flowering, so that's going to be late April, early May for us. Uh, it's drought tolerant once you've established it, and it suppresses yellow nutsedge and lamb's quarters. Uh, the challenges with hairy vetch are that the vines can be tangly, so if you're um, using like a, a scissor bar mower or something, it can get tangled up. Uh, it can be invasive if it sets seed. <laughs> so, <laughs> mow it at early flowering, I would. <laughs> It's not tolerant of shade or flooding, however. Um, so onto clovers. Um, this is crimson clover, our favorite. There's lots of different types of clover. Um, I haven't covered them all. I just chose the three that we use the most. Uh, they're going to add nitrogen. They're going to add biomass to the soil. They're going to attract beneficial insects and reduce your aphid problems. Uh, perhaps also your Colorado potato beetle problems. Um, you can use them almost any time of year. Um, they're best planted with a grass cr crop. Uh, they do sprawl on their own, although as you saw, we do that three-way clover mix and uh, it does okay. We're not trying to get 
a really tall crop there. You can do frost seeding. Uh, you wait till it's, this is for late winter, very early spring. Um, you prepare. You have your area prepared ahead of time, and when the ground is frozen, you go out early one morning. You broadcast the seeds on the frozen soil. You go inside and make a cup of coffee, and uh, as the frost thaws out, the clover seed is drawn down into the soil. As it happens, just about the right depth, with just about the right amount of water, and you don't have to water or anything. But you want to do this uh, February 15th to March the 15th in, in Central Virginia. How would you prepare the soil? Yeah, what would that mean? Uh, it would mean have it already um, disked or tilled, depending on your scale, or dug over if you're doing it by hand. Not just mowed or anything, it would have, I mean, have No, I mean, you can, um, yeah, that's like a kind of under-sowing. You mm -hmm. can, but you would need to have really mowed whatever else it was, and it would have to be something not too rambunctious, because <laughs> clovers are not super fast growing. Okay. And then what would that be followed by if you frost so February, uh, March? Right, you would want to leave it to grow until the summer or something, at least, and then for a fall crop or late summer, mm -hmm. late summer mm -hmm. or fall crop, yeah. Uh, crimson clover, I already said it's our favorite. Um, between September the 1st and October the 14th is the ideal time to sow it. We have a sort of cut-off date of October the 14th. We don't sow it after that. Um, it will make very fast growth in the spring, so it's good at that. Uh, if you have a supporting crop, like a, a grass, uh, it can grow up to three feet tall, otherwise up to 18 inches on its own. Uh, it flowers a little bit uh, uh, earlier than a hairy vetch, so if you've got them both in the mix and you don't want seed, you'll have to judge when you're going to uh, mow or disc it in by, by the clover flowering. Um, so we, if we just have crimson clover in our cover crop mix and we want to mow it at early bloom, for us that's going to be about um, April 20th, somewhere in the April 16th to May 2nd range. Um, you can sow it in early spring. It's not really recommended. It's not going to grow much before it flowers. It's going to flower on a short plant. So it's not really going to do you a lot of good in the spring, but you can. Um, it is shade tolerant and it's going to attract lots of beneficials, uh, including assassin bugs which eat Colorado potato beetle. Um, yeah, the year we had this growing right next to our March potatoes, we had almost no trouble with Colorado potato beetles. Right. It's a process of Italian ryegrass, that cover crop that I wasn't enthusiastic about. Uh, so here's a sort of short version of what we do. So we want vegetable crops that are cleared by the end of September or the middle of October in order to get the crimson clover in, in time. Uh, so that could be sweet corn, it could be June planted potatoes that we harvest in October, it could be watermelons, could be tomatoes and peppers. Anything you're, you're finishing up in, uh, by the middle of October. Uh, so then you sow the crimson clover and its grass with it um, by 10.15 or 10.14, uh, planning to turn it under in late April or early May. And so you can follow crimson clover with any of these crops that you plant after late April. Um, later corn plantings, winter squash, transplanted watermelon, tomatoes and peppers, sweet potatoes, June planted potatoes, fall brassicas. Any of those will work after crimson clover. The little white clovers, <laughs> they're actually perennials, but they're used mostly as winter annuals in the south. They're hardy down to minus 20, which is very convenient. So hardier than the red clovers, but they are small. You can frost seed in early spring, like I was saying about the other one, uh, or so in fall, but wait, do it at least six weeks before a hard frost. Don't sow in the summer unless you're sure you can keep the soil down, otherwise it won't germinate. Um, once you have got it established, it is drought tolerant, uh, but it's kind of slow. It doesn't compete well with weeds um, at first. Um, it will regrow well after mowing, it's good that way, and it tolerates foot traffic, so it's useful in those ways. Um, don't make the mistake of sowing the dwarf type in with grasses because it won't grow. <laughs> it 
they get buried. Uh, red clovers, they are short-lived perennials. Uh, the seed is usually cheap of red clover. You get good weed suppression. Um, it tolerates shade and poor drainage, but not flooding. It's fairly cold tolerant. It attracts lots of beneficial insects. <laughs> so where we are, um, uh, so in the fall or the spring, one or the other, like 30 days before the first fall frost or 30 days before the last spring frost. Not in the middle of winter, it's not a range there. <laughs> Up north, they do have a range. They do it um, before the last frost up to 30 days before the first frost. It gets too cold up there. They have to establish it in the summer. But for us, we do in the spring or the fall. Make sure it gets watered enough. Um, grows quite tall, three feet tall. Um, the mammoth is easier to establish in dryish soils and faster growing, but it's not going to grow, regrow very well if you mow it. So if you want to regrow after mowing, get the medium red. If you want these other benefits and you're not planning to mow, get the mammoth. There are times when clovers are not suitable. Um, they won't want to kill for us. Uh, you definitely want to consider avoiding legume cover crops before legume food crops um, because you could spread some pests and diseases this way. Um, we haven't seen that problem and we just keep going until we do see a problem because we like to use a lot of legumes in our cover crops. Um, watch out for problems if you do that. Also, red and crimson clovers, and some peas and beans and beets and buckwheat are not so good before white potatoes. Um, although, we've done it. <laughs> I think we've been lucky. <laughs> um, Austrian winter peas that are a great uh, late season, late sowing uh, legume. Um, it's a hardy type of field pea. They're sometimes called black peas because they're black. Um, they're different from the spring Canadian field peas. They're related, but they're different. Um, these are hardy to um, zero Fahrenheit. Uh, you can sow them later in the fall than you can clovers. So, as I said, we have a cutoff date of October the 14th for crimson clover. After that, if we're putting cover crop in, we won't use crimson clover, we'll use Austrian winter peas. We sort of have that watershed moment. <laughs> um, the optimum germination temperature is 75, um, but they'll do, they will germinate down to 41. Uh, they're pretty good at coming up through crusty soil, and they will tolerate a wide range of soil types and grow very quickly in the spring, have these beautiful flowers. Um, they suppress weeds, prevent erosion, they're high nitrogen fixers. Um, they can provide enough nitrogen for the following crop. Um, the seeds, here's a bit of an issue with it sometimes. The seeds are big compared to clover, so you have to buy a lot more weight of seed for the area, and it gets a bit pricey, but they are so good, and they're the only thing that you can do once you've got past the middle of October, the only legume you can do after the middle of October for us. Um, it blooms in late April where we are, uh, so it's a little bit before hairy vetch. Uh, the tendrils and shoot tips make nice additions to salads or stir fries in the spring. And you have a whole field of them. It's fantastic. <laughs> They're really tasty. Uh, so here's the sort of short version. Um, we follow any of these things in the first box there, the late finishing things. Winter squash, melons, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, peppers. Middle sweet corn, middle season sweet corn that is. Um, June planted potatoes, any of those. We could sow Austrian winter peas in the mix with winter wheat or rye, anywhere between October the 1st and November the 11th. And then the next year, um, allowing time for flowering, you can plant winter squash, it's the same list. Melons, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, peppers. Middle sweet corn, June planted potatoes. So really the, the um, the cover crops and the food crops, it sort of divides up into a sort of the late running crops and the early crops. And somewhere, if you can do a sequence of these late crops, like this for a few years, but somewhere you're going to need to make a transition so that you can get an early crop in, and then you can do a few years of early crops, and then you can make the transition back to, to late crops. But we'll see this at, at the end of the slideshow if we have time. Uh, 
Um, you can't store pea seed for very long. Like most peas, uh, the germination rate drops after a couple of years. So if you have bought the seed, I sometimes think, oh, we may as well plant it. You know, we've bought it. Um, so sometimes we do, um, it's not on this slide, but if we're kind of around about, if we're in early October and we're going to use crimson clover in our mix, sometimes if we've bought Austrian winter peas and we're not foreseeing having a lot of other places, we're going to use them. Sometimes we'll throw those in as well um, because we think by next year the seed won't be in very good shape. Um, so you could do that. <laughs> uh, I think I said that a bit. Uh, They're no good uh, in the spring. Not do they just they need a cold dormant spell. It's not just it's not just like with the clover that they'll start flowering when they're very short. It's that they actually need a cold dormant spell to, to germinate well. So you won't get very good germination if you try and do them in the spring. Uh, they don't tolerate flooding or drought or high traffic or salinity or heavy shade or long cold spring weather without snow cover um, or hot or even warm weather. So they're a bit picky. They really like the cool, damp kind of weather. That's their best. Um, once they start blooming, if you mow them, they're not going to regrow. And then they don't add much organic matter to the soil. Uh, the vines break down very quickly. They do add nitrogen, but they're not adding much organic matter. Uh, they could possibly increase 39 species of pest nematodes. <laughs> so if you're already having trouble with nematodes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that one. Uh, they are susceptible to some diseases, uh, yes, so if you know you've got those, don't choose this one. If you, if you don't know you've got those, I'd say try it and see, just watch and write it down. Um, in the summer, we like to use soybeans a lot, um, as you may know, Twin Oaks has an organic tofu business, so we have tons of uh, organic soybeans at good prices for us in the garden. Um, most, uh, almost all of the soy that's grown in the United States, if it's not organic, it's GMO. So watch out. Uh, there, there is this other category called identity preserved. Some of it is farmers transitioning towards organic. Some of it is farmers that don't want to be organic, uh, but want to let everybody know that they're not GMO. And you can find those, uh, and they are cheaper than buying organic if you want to. The, it's in the resource section, the, the contact info. Okay, so in September, the, this is kind of take, going to take one month at a time, so um, to make it easier to think about. September is the easiest time, if you're new to growing cover crops, it's the easiest time to start. Um, you harvest your summer vegetables, and you put in a winter cover crop or two. You've got a lot of choices, you then have a lot of time to plan your next move. Uh, the first half of September is okay for oats in central Virginia. Any time in September is okay for rye, wheat, or barley, and hairy vetch, crimson clover, or Austrian winter peas. So in September, lots of choices. Uh, in October, um, we, we like to um, end our watermelon, sweet potatoes, and winter squash. We used to try and get every last squash, every last watermelon. <laughs> we don't do that anymore because we've realized the value of establishing good winter cover crops and also of not spending so much time harvesting. And who wants watermelon in late October anyway? So finish those off, get good cover crops in. Um, uh, we like to use, if we're before mid-October, we do winter wheat and crimson clover. If we're after mid-October, we do winter wheat or rye with Austrian winter peas. That, that's our sort of switchover point. Uh, if you're in early November, up to November the 8th, you can still do winter wheat or rye with Austrian winter peas. Uh, winter wheat is easier to incorporate in the spring than rye, so, but it's, uh, it, you can't do it as late as you can do rye. Um, you can do rye with us up to the middle of November, so it's another week. Uh, it's too cold for anything else to make much growth. Uh, winter rye is hardy down to minus 30. Uh, it's only worth sowing it in November if you're going to give it time in the spring to make some growth, because it's not going to make very much growth before the winter. So don't plan, don't rush out, 
on, um, in the middle of November to sow rye and then plan to incorporate it in early April. You want to give it a bit longer than that, um, otherwise you won't have much to put into the soil. Uh, if we're after middle of November, we just leave the weeds uh, for the winter. We don't want to have bare soil all floating away when it rains. Uh, so our fall carrots, for instance, we harvest them in November. It's usually too late to sow rye. So what we do is we uh, barrow the um, carrot tops back out and spread them out over the top of the soil just to help hold it together a bit. And, and then we let the weeds grow. It grows super tall, up to seven feet. Uh, it will mow kill at flowering, uh, but not earlier. Uh, it does suppress weeds nicely, especially lambs, quarters, red root, pigweed, and ragweed. Uh, you can start, you can do it 14 days before the first fall frost to, to 28 days after the last frost, but I wouldn't do that in the middle of the winter. You can sow it, it will survive, but it's, if you've, you know, in the middle of the winter, I think it's better not to till, it's better just to leave things as they are till you get to early spring. Um, you can sow it in the spring, but oats would be better in the spring because it will break, they'll break down quicker. Uh, you don't want to sow it in August in our climate, it sets seed. Um, you do want to allow in the spring, you want to allow three or four weeks uh, after you till it in for those uh, allelopathic compounds to break down, before, especially before you sow seeds, small seeds. Spring um, cover crops. In February and March we sow oats when we've got uh, an eight week gap till we need the land. If we hadn't, like if we've got Especially we do this in our raised bed area. If we uh, don't have a cover crop sown in the fall and we've come up with our plan for what we're going to plant in the beds and we realize we're not going to plant anything uh, for another eight weeks, then we put some oats in, keep the weeds down, add some organic matter. But once we get to March the 31st, that's too late for oats for us. Um, they just make, you know, they grow and then they make oats. <laughs> so. We don't do that. We might put winter rye in. Um, it does, we, it, it, although it's out of season, <laughs> you can sow it in the spring, and once it gets warm, it'll just sort of stop growing and wimp out. <laughs> uh, we did this one year when our spring potatoes got flooded. Um, we actually moved some potato plants up to the top of the, uh, the area, and then when the flood dried out a bit, we sowed winter rye, even though it was April. Uh, and it just, it grew a bit, it held the soil together, and then it didn't do anything traumatic. And when we got to potato harvest time in July, it was very easy to till that in as well. So that was a sort of emergency, off-label use of winter rye, it worked <laughs> fine. Um, if we've got to early April, it's too soon to sow the frost tender cover crops, but it's too late to sow oats. So for a couple of weeks there, we would probably just do a stale seedbed technique where you prepare your beds or your rows ahead of time and then hoe to get rid of the weeds and then plant them. You've kind of dealt with the weeds that way. That works, that works okay then. Uh, once we get to late April, frosts are hopefully past, we'll start out, start using buckwheat. Um, if it's sort of borderline, you can add some grain, some kind of cereal, uh, winter rye or wheat in with the buckwheat as insurance. It will grow and it will, to some extent, protect the buckwheat, but also, um, uh, it, if the buckwheat does die, you've still got something. Uh, if we have big spaces in the summer, we grow sorghum sedan grass. Um, uh, watch out for pearl millet. It also grows very big. Uh, it put me off millets for quite a long time, but foxtail millet grows between three and four feet tall. Japanese millet goes up to five feet. Pearl millet goes up to 10 feet. Same like storm and sedan grass, watch out. Especially if you're um, just using small equipment. You don't want to tackle sorghum sedan grass or pearl millet with small equipment. You need a tractor. Um, okay, zooming on. Uh, if we've got 28 day gap, we'll do buckwheat. You could do mustards if you do do brassica cover crops, which we don't. If you've got 40 days, um, we do soy in with the buckwheat. 50 to 60 days, the Japanese and the brown top millets. 60 to 70 days, sorghum, sedan grass, German hot millet, pearl millet, 
maybe some Kelpies. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, I was yeah. just thinking with the with the um, doing the the beans though. Don't you have a problem with the Mexican bean beetles? Like kind of. Well, they're not so fond of soy. Oh, they're not. Japanese beetles are more, but uh, and we for the bean beetle we buy those petio wasps, mm -hmm. and so they'll go for the bean beetles wherever they so are. So you don't have that much of a problem with usually them. not. Mm -hmm. Usually, it just seems like we'd be growing even more yummies for them. But if, if right, right, get rid of the Mexican bean beetles is my <laughs> recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they're awful. They are awful, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can under-sow um, buckwheat or, or white clover in the spring, in the, uh, where you've got a spring vegetable that is going to be done, and then you let the cover crop grow a bit longer. Not the, the buckwheat won't grow longer, but the white clover. Um, you can do buckwheat um, between rows of winter squash or watermelon or sweet potatoes or something. Uh, with the plan of mowing it or tilling it once the food crop starts to get bigger. Uh, we did it once between winter squash rows and we didn't get to it and we couldn't till and we couldn't mow. We actually ended up <coughs> wading in amongst the squash plants, <coughs> pulling out. It was horrible. Um, if you want to under sow buckwheat in sweet corn, uh, don't sow it the same day as the corn, that's too soon. Don't wait for the eight leaf stage, it's too late. The sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. Um, right, I've talked about buckwheat. Um, it's nice because you can, it's nice for many reasons. One of them is that you can uh, work it in with uh, small scale equipment. Uh, you can let it self seed if you have got uh, like a couple of months. I'm going to zoom past some of these because it's later than, uh, later than I expected. Um, but buckwheat, uh, buckwheat's good for almost everything. You can use it to bring neglected land back in or uh, <coughs> prepare land for perennials like we did this with our, uh, when we were planting asparagus. Um, you you um, till or disc and then you sow some buckwheat and then you can let it self-seed until again and the volunteers come up. Uh, and it improves the soil uh, and whilst sort of occupying the space that your crop doesn't yet occupy and dealing with the weeds, suppresses the weeds. Uh, it's not at all frost tolerant, doesn't tolerate salt, shade or compacted soil. Um, pigweed and lambs quarters and barnyard grass will get through somehow. Um, yeah. Um, pest control with cover crops. Um, we once were preparing to plant strawberries and we grew a, a forage brassica, it was a kind of canola. Um, but that's when we discovered that brassica cover crops are not for us. We put too many harlequin bugs uh, and it was awful. So now we just never do brassica cover crops. Um, some people do. <laughs> uh, and there are good reasons to if you don't have harlequin bugs, but we do. Uh, we do some cover crops in the hoop house in the summer, and this is a thing if you have a hoop house, high tunnel, you could consider if you don't want to grow summer food crops in there, depends on your climate, like what you're trying to grow, but for some of us uh, in the summer you don't really need to be doing food crops in a hoop house because it's plenty warm enough outside. Um, but you, you can, we have, we, we have done buckwheat, some of the millets are manageable, you don't want to do those really big grasses in your hoop house if you're not going to rather like, it depends on the design, you know, if you've arranged it so you can go through with your tractor and equipment, you could do it, but if you're going in there with your little rototiller, you don't want to do the sorghum sedan grass. Or, okay, uh, biofumigation, um, you can use mustards uh, to uh, deal with either pests or weeds or both, uh, you can increase the result by solarizing the soil where you put clear plastic over the soil. You grow the mustard, you put the clear plastic over them, bury the edges and um, this will um, uh, kill off various pests and diseases, uh, weeds. Um, there's three different kinds from mighty mustard, 
You want to make sure you get the right one. You don't want to just buy generic kind of yellow mustard seed because it might not do the thing you're hoping. There's Kodiak mustard. It suppresses soil-borne fungal pathogens and nematodes and makes a lot of biomass. So it's kind of uh, some of everything. There's Pacific Gold, which is particularly for nematodes and soil-borne funguses. Uh, there's Ida Gold, which is particularly for suppressing the germination of weed seeds. So this is a thing that you can do, a way you can use cover crops to suppress problems. <laughs> um, I happen to know something about root knot nematodes, unfortunately. Uh, we got peanut root knot nematode popped up in our hoop house. And um, at first we were horrified and we just thought, oh, we have to get rid of this. And we actually took one bed of our hoop house out of production for a year. We did a series of cover crops to repel the nematodes and we did the solarizing and all the rest of it and then they popped up somewhere else and then we thought we, we should change our approach and think more in terms of managing the nematodes rather than obliterating them from the face of the earth. So now we do this, um, we do two years of resistant crops followed by one year of somewhat susceptible food crops. Um, the re most resistant food crops we found are, are kale, eukina, savoy, radishes in the winter, some of the Asian greens there. And then in the summer, West Indian gherkins, Mississippi silver or Carolina crowder cowpeas. Um, so if you, if you need to know, you can come back to this slideshow in the future, but I hope you never need to know. Um, a little bit about mixes. Um, you can get the advantages of different ingredients in your mixes uh, by putting them all in together. Uh, also, you're kind of hedging your bets. If you put several different kinds of seeds in, one might do better in a particular kind of weather. Um, but it can be a bit bedazzling to think about putting lots of things in together. So uh, there's a recommendation that you start with between one and three cover crop species that address your main goals for the cover crops there. And then you think about what other ser services, missing services they call them, uh, and add in one or two other cover crops. So don't try too many at once. You know, work out from one or two. We're at the three level. <laughs> uh, gradually increase the number of species. Um, it, it might be good to know. You can sow them all at one inch deep. And... Um, when you want to choose the date, you want to go by the grasses in the mix. Choose the date range for the grasses. And just put all the seeds in there together. When you mix two grasses, you can reduce the seeding rate by a third, not a half, just a third. But you don't want to reduce the seeding rate of the legumes. You want to put them in at a full rate or up to 25% less, but not much less than they would if they were just going to be sown on their own. Those are some uh, little tricks doing mixes. If you're using oats, cut the, the rate of the oats back because they're a bit too assertive. <laughs> um, yeah, I already said this bit about putting crimson clover and Austrian winter peas in together on a borderline date. Uh, so, go on. So, some spring mixes. Um, to start out, you know, an idea of somewhere to start, you could do oats and peas. You could do um, three oats to seven peas by weight. Uh, you could add in some hairy vetch, some radishes, turnips, red clover. If you're in the summer, the main mixes could be uh, soy, cowpeas, red clover, and buckwheat. And you could add in a bit of pearl millet, maybe. Prozo millet, radishes, turnips, sunflowers. Uh, you could add in some of those. Um, you can also do uh, kind of nurse and patient mixes where one crop is helping another protect another one, like using oats in September, early September or August, um, to uh, protect a legume, like crimson clover. Uh, and your intention there is that the oats will die and the clover will carry on. Um, this is a mix of oats and buckwheat. You can see the buckwheat seeding and also clover. Um, you can use manual seeders like the earthway seeders for small areas of cover crops. BABF has an info sheet about it, um, including the information about what plate to use for which cover crop seed. So 
So for crimson clover you use the beet plate, for the other clovers you use the light carrot plate, for the winter peas you use the pea plate, unsurprisingly. Um, for these other, a lot of these other cover crops, I think it says the 22 plate and I couldn't find one. Lima bean is the number 24 plate, so um, you could try that out or you could look, I haven't looked it up recently. You could double check, and see if they've changed. Um, we use a BCS um, tiller. We have a, that's a 722, we use a 732. Um, we often broadcast and just till in on a shallow setting, till in um, cover crops. Uh, if you've got a bigger area than you want to broadcast because it just makes your arm tired, you can get one of those spin seeders. They don't cost all that much. Um, if you're doing small plot and you want to mow it, um, if you don't have a suitable lawn mower, you can use a nylon line trimmer if you want to chop it up into lots of little bits, or a scythe if you want to do no-till and leave it in long pieces. Uh, there is a roll of crimper made to go behind some of the bigger BCS tillers. It costs a thousand dollars. I've seen it and um, you definitely want to see it in action or watch the YouTube. I kind of think it would loose, shake all your wrist bones loose. <laughs> I don't know, but it does exist if you're interested. Uh, incorporating the cover crops, as I said before, you want to grow them to early bloom to get the most growth uh, and for legumes to get the most nitrogen. Um, but you do want to incorporate before they set seed. Um, mow them first, uh, if, well not for buckwheat, buckwheat chops up easily with a tiller. But um, most of the cover crops you want to mow them first, you know, if you've got great big cover crops. Mow them first, chop them into little bits and then incorporate them. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to put them deep down in your soil, you just want to keep them shallow up there in the top six to eight inches where most of the action happens. You don't want to give them a permanent burial down there in the clay. Um, and uh, I mentioned with rye, wait, do it three or four weeks ahead of time, ahead of needing to plant. Um, so, how available is the nitrogen anyway uh, from the cover crops? It depends on the carbon to nitrogen ratio of your cover crop. Soil microbes have a carbon to nitrogen ratio 10 to 1. So when you put a cover crop into the soil, they'll use the carbon and some of the nitrogen to make some more microbes, and they tie it up then until they die. So it's not immediately available. So if you put in a cover crop with a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, like sorghum sedan, it's just about all carbon, the microbes will need to find extra nitrogen to make use of as much of that carbon as they can. So they'll use the nitrogen from the soil and they'll tie it up until they die. So anything that you plant immediately after a high carbon to nitrogen ratio cover crop will need a separate, need good nitrogen source straight away. Um, legumes have a carbon to nitrogen ratio somewhere in the 30 to 1 to 12 to 1 range. So when you incorporate those, um, the microbes don't, don't need to use it all up. So there's still some nitrogen available for the crop. Uh, there's a really good explanation in this, it's in the resources section, the North Carolina Extension Service. Uh, it's just to say, you know, if it's a high carbon cover crop, your crop, food crop is going to need some nitrogen from somewhere else. If it's a high nitrogen cover crop, uh, you won't need to worry about that so much. And eventually, those microbes that have all been created by other microbes eating up all your cover crop, they are going to die. The nitrogen is going to be released into the soil. It's just a question of when it's going to be available. Uh, I kind of I think I've said most of this. Um, uh, get your high carbon cover crops into the soil in good time, a few, few weeks ahead of planting your food, next food crop. Um, if you're leaving your cover crop residues on the surface in a no-till, uh, there'll be a slower rate of decomposition. Um, oh yes, yeah, some of the carbon from cover crops is, is below the root zone, it's below the 8 inches. Um, so it, you've got more in the soil than is usually measured. Usually when they go out and measure the nitrogen and the carbon from cover crops, they only measure the top bit of the soil. There is more down there, <laughs> which will become available later. So it's all, you know, if you take the long-term view, uh, you'll get more nutrients 
cycling in later on. Um, I have a, this other slideshow, Crop Rotations for Vegetables and Color Crops, that does go into this in detail, which I'm not going to do now. Um, but if you want to plan a rotation for your vegetables that fits cover crops in as well, first of all, figure out how much area you need for each of your major food crops. Measure and map your uh, garden's fields. Divide it up into plots that are each big enough to take your biggest space hog crops. And then figure out the other things, group them together to fill out the space. Figure out a good sequence, which crop is best after what, and include your cover crops in that. Try it for a year and make improvements. Uh, we started with Elliot Coleman, the organic grower. 1996, we were trying to figure out a rotation, and we followed his suggestion to write your main crops on cards, and then you can move them as you're determining your sequence. He had them in a straight line. We decided we prefer a circle because it does all come around again. Uh, so we did this, and then we did, went to colour coding. Wow, the colours look a bit strange from here. The sort of gold or greeny gold coloured ones are the corn. Um, we've got three of those. We've got three brown ones, which are potatoes and tomatoes. We keep the winter squash and the watermelon far apart from each other. And we've got a couple of other ones, different shades of green there. Um, so we did that. We moved the cards around till we got a sequence we liked. And then we drew it up on a piece of card. Uh, you're going to see it on the next slide. Um, we call it our rotation pinwheel. And we fastened to it in the center a separate disc of card using one of those brass paper clips. And the center disc, I'll show you, it'll make more sense. That center disc is actually a separate piece of card. And it's the plots, A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And each year we just move that round one notch clockwise. And it tells us what's going to be in which plot the next year. And that saved us a lot of head scratching. <laughs> and so you can see, I hope, uh, the main pie slices there are the food crops we're going to grow. And out on the pie crust are the winter cover crops that follow that particular food crop. So it all works itself out. And we've been round. We used it for the same piece of card for 20 years. <gasps> and it has some white out and a few changes. <laughs> but uh, we've still got the original. Uh, yeah. So this is the, yeah, this is the standing one of our fields for 10 years segments, the last mm. bit of the slideshow. Uh, so this, I hope, will help to make sense of uh, a sort of sequence of uh, crop rotation for vegetables that includes cover crops as well. So say in the first year in this plot, we're going to have the winter squash. We sow it in late May, so there's plenty of time up till then uh, for a legume that previous winter to reach flowering. And so um, we do that, we prep the soil, we plant the squash, we harvest it. We finish it on Halloween. That's early enough to use Austrian winter peas in the mix, although it's past our um, 10, 10, 14, 10, 15 date for crimson clover. So we do Austrian winter peas uh, with rye. And the next year, uh, that plot is going to be planted in um, late sweet corn and sweet potatoes. It works well um, in that they're both late planted, so we have plenty of time for the Austrian winter peas to reach flowering before we need to prep the soil for planting these two crops. Um, it does, what doesn't work so well is the next bit. Half the plot that's in the late corn we under sow with the oats and soy that I talked about earlier. The following year we're going to have spring potatoes, so it's really nice to have the oats and soy in the sweet corn there. Uh, it's easily easy to work the soil in the early spring to get those potatoes in. But the sweet potatoes don't finish till October. It's too late to sow oats. This is the unideal bit of our rotation. Uh, we sow wheat, just wheat. We don't put a legume in because we're going to be disking that area in February of the next year. There isn't going to be time to benefit, so we don't put a legume in. We put wheat because we can't, it's too late for oats. A wheat is a bit easier to incorporate than rye, so that's what we do. The next year, that's one of the first plots to be disked up. We plant the potatoes in March, we harvest them in July, and then we do this crazy um, 
after, the, after we've got the potatoes out, we've more, spread more compost, work it all up, we transplant our fall broccoli and cabbage. So we're going to get two food crops in the same year out of this patch. Then we under sow that broccoli and cabbage uh, when it's a month after transplanting with the mix of clovers. That's going to give our all year green fallow the next year. Uh, as I said, if all goes well. And we monitor it several times during the year and have a plan for what to do if it doesn't go well. But if it does stay growing really nicely, then we keep it through the following winter and disc it in early uh, for the, the first sweet corn. So um, we got two food crops in year three. We didn't get a food crop in year four out of that plot. So it averages out one year there. Um, we plant the sweet corn, first sweet corn, and then when that's finished, we divide the, well, actually, we sow oats in the whole plot. Uh, so it's going to be in August, early August. Uh, we divide the plot in half. One half we just mow from time to time. Um, we're going to grow our garlic there. The other half we leave alone over the winter. <laughs> so we don't want the oats to get too out of hand. Um, and we just them in late fall and we plant the garlic. So we have a bit of a tight rotation for that half a plot. It goes from sweet corn to oats for the winter. Uh, well, oats for the summer and the fall, really. Garlic for the fall and the winter. Uh, when we harvest the garlic in June, we sow buckwheat and soy. And then this is where we sow our fall carrots in August, early August. Um, we sow the fall carrots. So that, that's got uh, three food crops in two years in that half a plot. Uh, and we don't, as I said, we don't manage to get a cover crop in after the carrots. But the other half of this plot is going to be for our spring broccoli and cabbage. So we turn the oats under in mid February. Um, roll out hay, transplant into it. Um, the spring broccoli and cabbage will finish in the summer <coughs> and we might sow some buckwheat if we're in good time. But then when we get to early September, we sow our no-till mix of rye and hairy veg and winter peas uh, because it's nice and good time. And then the next year, uh, we transplant our paste tomatoes and peppers into that no-till mulch in early May. Um, that crop doesn't finish till the frost, and we have all the posts to deal with, so uh, it's not going to be very early for the next winter cover crop. So it's usually rye and Austrian winter peas. We're usually after the middle of October for that one, but we're usually before November the 8th. And the next year is going to be the watermelon. So um, the uh, Austrian winter peas has plenty of time to flower um, before we just get in the cover crop, prepare for planting watermelon. We finish the watermelon in late September, disc it up, we put in either wheat or rye with crimson clover for the winter cover crop. We are in time for crimson clover with that one. The next year uh, is going to be the mid-season corn. Uh, we sow that in early June, so the crimson clover has plenty of time to flower before we disc. Um, the corn does well and um, finishes, well it's just about finished now I would say. Um, we have time to get wheat or rye with crimson clover in and that will produce lots of nitrogen and the next year it's going to be the June potatoes. We plant potatoes twice a year, we do March and we do June. Um, we like having our potato eggs in two baskets and also we like that these potatoes are going to be in the ground during July and August. They're not going to be in the root cellar. We're not going to be trying to keep them cool. It works better for us to do this second planting. And then we harvest them in October, put them in our root cellar, and they store a lot better than potatoes that we harvest in July. The only difficult thing is finding seed potatoes in June. You can't, really. So we buy them uh, in April or late March and store them under refrigeration until we want to plant them. Um, uh, what we do is uh, we plant the potatoes and cover them over. We hill the same day, and then the next day we roll out mulch over the top of the potatoes. We do kind of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, hay mulch, up, up hill and down dale, across the whole patch, uh, and this will help keep the soil a bit cooler because it's, we're heading into July and August, so it's going to be horribly hot. Um, we harvest them in October.
October, and we have time to get wheat or rye. Sometimes we get crimson clover in in time, sometimes it's Austrian winter peas. And then back to year one, the next year, it's winter squash again. So that's standing in our field for 10 years in five minutes. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit of a whiz around. <laughs> um, the resources section is all on your handout. I won't do that, I won't talk about that. There's the contact information, and we've got 10 minutes for questions. Yay. Woo. Okay.